What happens when self-defense is against the law? What happens when the protectors become the predators? What happens when innocents are betrayed? Imagine that two-thirds of all Americans disappear. 170 million people. Or that the countries of Germany, France, and Spain are virtually wiped off the map. 170 million people gone. In the 20th century, that's how many innocents were slaughtered, tortured, starved, mutilated, worked to death, bayoneted, hanged, annihilated at the hands of their governments. They had no means to defend themselves. But of course, these horrors struck other people far away. People who are different from us. Countries that are different from ours. Surely, it can't happen here. The United States, at its best, is a great nation. Yet here, too, people can become powerless targets. They may suffer simply for being who they are. It is the 19th century. Up to four million Americans are slaves, entirely without rights. A quarter of a million free blacks live among them. Many work to outlaw slavery. A spirit of rebellion grows. And among the white majority, fear grows. Maintaining total control of slaves becomes an obsession. America's earliest disarmament laws are designed to keep one race, and one race only, helpless.
slaves rise in rebellion, tension increases, and states pass even more laws to control blacks. In 1865, the North wins the war between the states, ending slavery forever. Three years later, the 14th Amendment extends full citizenship and equal legal protection to the former slaves. That is, the law extends equal protection in theory. When states can no longer pass laws like this, they pass laws like these instead to keep guns out of the hands of poor blacks. Disarmament does not bring peace or safety, certainly not to blacks. Between 1880 and 1965, mobs lynch nearly 3,500 black people, sometimes for serious crimes, sometimes for mere insults against whites. So-called respectable citizens snatch defenseless men from jails or from the streets. They abuse, torture, mutilate, and kill their victims. Yet defensive power sometimes prevails. In Columbia, South Carolina, a 14-year-old girl stops a lynch mob from seizing a prisoner by holding the mob at bay with a revolver she doesn't even know how to shoot. Today, lynchings are a thing of the past, but some things never change. Purchase a gun from a licensed dealer, and even now you must reveal your race. Another group of people is stripped of its weapons with tragic consequences. From the first arrival of Europeans on North American shores, relations between whites and natives, called Indians, have been uneasy. As settlers push further into Indian lands, the situation boils. Each side commits and accuses the other of committing atrocities. In 1864, U.S. Army troops gunned down 150 Cheyenne and Arapaho members at Sand Creek in Colorado Territory. Most of the dead are women, children, and old people. Inevitably, the better armed whites overpower the tribes. Near the end of the century, desperate Indians of many tribes adopt a new religion. They believe if they perform a certain ritual, called the ghost dance, the whites will be magically swept away. In late 1890, the ghost dance sweeps the reservations of the Lakota Sioux. Whites fear the Lakota are planning a war and try to force the ghost dancers to halt. Although many Sioux give up their religion, some bands refuse. The army is called in to transport the ghost dancers out of the territory. In December 1890, the last band of dancers is pinned at Wounded Knee Creek. Ordered by the army, they hand over a few dozen rifles. But believing the whites plan to kill them, young men hide weapons. While the soldiers search the camp, a medicine man begins the ghost dance. The soldiers think he is giving a signal to attack. Somewhere in the band of Indians, someone discharges a rifle. The army opens fire. The battle is over after just 10 minutes of heavy fire. But soldiers pursue the retreating Indians and gun down everyone they find. The bodies of women, babies, and old men are scattered as much as three miles from the battlefield. When governments fear the people, disarmament often follows. The law may target one group, but other individuals pay the consequences. World War II. President Roosevelt issues an executive order authorizing the War Department to exclude any and all persons from vast military zones. The order doesn't identify any group. 
but everyone understands it means people of Japanese ancestry. Of the 110,000 who are rounded up and sent to camps, more than two-thirds are American citizens. They have committed no crimes. Being citizens doesn't protect them. They are disarmed as enemy aliens. Ironically, the U.S. government soon recruits young Japanese-American men from these camps. And the young men go on to become part of one of the most highly decorated infantry regiments to fight in World War II. Some German and Italian Americans are also taken to camps without being accused of any crime. Those imprisoned include American-born children. Like the Japanese, those sent to camps are disarmed. Some U.S. citizens are even deported to Germany. When they have defense tools equal to those of attackers, people have the power to protect themselves. Once powerless, people can fall victim to any aggressor at any time. October 16, 1991, a bright, sunny day in Colleen, Texas, a crowded coffee shop. Young doctor Susanna Grasha is lunching with her parents. She often carries a sidearm for self-defense, but today she has left the gun in her car in the parking lot because it is illegal for her to keep the weapon in her purse. She's afraid she'll lose her license to practice if she's caught with it. Susanna Grasha is about to lose something much more precious. A truck crashes through the window. A man leaps out and methodically begins shooting customers to death. Susanna reaches for her purse. Then she remembers. Self-defense is a hundred feet away. And the police can't come for endless minutes. Susanna can only watch and then scramble desperately through a window as her father and mother are murdered. Twenty-three people die on a bright, sunny noon at Luby's cafeteria. On the early morning of August 23, 2000, the children of John and Tepany Carpenter are alone in their rural California home. All five Carpenter children know how to shoot, but California law requires that guns be locked away from children. With her sisters and brothers still in bed, 14-year-old Jessica enters the family kitchen, where a half-naked stranger awaits her with a pitchfork. The stranger has barricaded the doors and windows. He has cut the phone line. There is nothing to stop him. Stalking down the hallway, he begins stabbing 13-year-old Anna. Youngest sister Ashley, just nine years old, leaps into the hall and draws the madman away. Horribly wounded, Ashley dives at his legs, screaming for her sisters to go, go, go. The girls all think of the gun but they can't use it to save Ashley or their little brother. The three oldest girls escape. They rush to a neighbor's house and plead for his rifle, but the neighbor says no, saying the government would take his gun away. By the time police arrive, Ashley is dead from 138 pitchfork wounds to her face, chest, and neck. Seven-year-old John William also lies dead, stabbed 46 times. Once people accept being disarmed, they become surprisingly easy to control and to kill. They have surrendered not only their weapons, but their independence. When innocents are rendered so defenseless, the guilty can slaughter them with the most ordinary of weapons. A club, a knife, a pitchfork, or these.
Lies like lions after slumber. In a vain questionable number. Shake your chains to earth like dew. Which in sleep have fallen on you. We are many. They are. 